Hey everyone, Darius from Self Archaeology here. I got a lot of requests to do a Joker movie slash character analysis. A few days ago I finally went to see it, so here are my thoughts. Oh, and before I go into it, there will be spoilers, of course, because I can't talk about the movie without talking about what happened in it. So if you haven't seen it yet, and if you don't want to hear spoilers, please come back to this video later. Um, first, I just wanted to record a quick video, but then I started making notes and it ended up being a 10-page script. I don't want to forget any important details or ramble too much, so I will try to read the whole script here. First, I'll just talk very briefly about the movie itself. The acting was really good. Joaquin Phoenix's acting was superb. I really liked it. The actress who played his mom, I believe her name is Frances Conroy. She is also a very acclaimed actress. And you may know her from her roles in Six Feet Under, Arrested Development, and many others. Regarding the plot, it could have gone many different ways because there are so many interpretations of the Batman universe and the Joker character, but overall it was good. Nothing stood out as horrible or too silly. Actually, the movie was more realistic than any other Batman movie or video game plot I've encountered. And for me personally... Um, it was a little too depressing, a little too real. Arthur's character was so pitiful, so pathetic, and the event seemed very realistic, very plausible, compared to other Batman plots where there are superpowers and plot holes and mysteries and dumb motives. Arthur was just a mentally ill, abused, lonely, betrayed, hurting person who eventually becomes so fed up so hopeless, so cynical and nihilistic that he turns to violence. Now, somebody asked me if I liked Joaquin Phoenix's Joker better than Heath Ledger's Joker. I think Heath Ledger's Joker will be the best Joker for me for a long time. It was a very good combination between being not too cartoony, but not overly realistic. Again, this Joker movie was a little too realistic for my taste, while other Jokers elsewhere were too cartoony and too silly. Heat's Joker? He's just right where I like it to be. Also, as a character, Heat's Joker is cunning, smart, manipulative, more thoughtful, more mysterious. Joaquin's Joker is just mentally ill, obviously hurting He's frustrated, he's highly sympathetic, uh, but he's not a very smart guy. He's chaotic, but more in a clumsy and incompetent way. Mostly, he's just really pitiful and tragic. And maybe later, in the sequel, he evolves and becomes Joker proper, because this is just the origin story. But from what we've seen so far... He's just too pitiful and incompetent for a supervillain mastermind. It's not even necessarily worse than Heath's Joker. It's just different, a different point in Joker's life. Now, the movie Joker I liked better than Heath Ledger's movie. Plot-wise, character-wise, I liked it much better. I barely remember, to be honest, anything from Heat's movie except for the Joker scenes. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the movie from the creative standpoint, because I don't know enough about cinematography. I have written some professional book reviews, but I don't know that much about directing and lighting and sound and similar technical stuff. So overall, it's a good movie. I recommend it. And now let's dive into the psychological analysis. 
Obviously, Arthur has many psychological and emotional problems. That's evident. In one scene with his social worker, it is revealed that he's on seven different medications and he's asking for more because he's too tired of all the pain that he's feeling daily and it's not getting better. He also says that all he has is negative thoughts. A few times we are able to see a bit of his personal journal and there is some disturbing stuff in there. He seems to have some schizophrenic tendencies where he dissociates and imagines things. In other words, he has delusions in order to cope with reality and his overwhelming emotions. He is also antisocial, not so much in a sense that he doesn't like people, although he doesn't, but more in a clinical sense where he exhibits antisocial tendencies and behaviors and later specifically psychopathic traits. So some of those antisocial traits would be his inability to stay employed, his disturbing behavior around people, his lack of social awareness, his disregard for other people's boundaries and well-being, his aggression, irresponsibility, impulsivity, being prone to drug abuse and addiction, he's a smoker and he's on many medications, his poor emotional regulation, impulsivity, callousness, a lack of remorse, and so on. Later in the movie, when he gets closer to becoming Joker, he becomes more eccentric, more narcissistic, more psychopathic. But at first, he's not so much of that. Arthur is socially awkward. He doesn't understand social cues. He doesn't understand what is funny and why, which is vital for a stand-up comedian. And the fact that he doesn't realize that means that he's unaware of his obvious shortcomings. He finds things that are not funny to others funny and vice versa. He also doesn't know how to act normally and naturally in public unless he tries to fake it. He tries to mimic others, to learn how to behave in certain social situations, to appear normal instead of being able to act appropriately and naturally. For instance, when he laughs very loudly before leaving work after a joke and then stops laughing immediately when he realizes that his co-workers can't hear him anymore, or when he practices his appearance on the Murray Franklin show to the smallest detail, including facial expressions, body movements, and so on or when he tries to understand what people find funny and why, and he still can't quite understand it. Arthur's depression. Now, Arthur is obviously incredibly depressed. This is seen in many scenes in the movie. He feels miserable. He feels lonely. He feels betrayed. He feels stuck. He is in constant emotional and physical pain and he is hopeless. Things often go very badly for him, or he puts himself in unfortunate circumstances. Meanwhile, deep down, he just is trying to get by, to live his life, to survive in this cruel place. Arthur doesn't seem to be very smart. He's not too dumb, but he's not very smart either. His writings have many grammatical errors, as we see. He's not very educated. He's quite incompetent, actually. For instance, he brings a gun to a children's hospital, and then he drops it on the floor and gets fired for it. However, unlike many villains and otherwise bad people in real life, he's not very manipulative and exploitative, though, at least as Arthur. He seems, he seems to be a decent guy deep down. If he lies, it is usually in a way that it doesn't hurt others. It's more for sheer self 
preservation. For instance, he lied about the gun being just a prop for his show. But one could argue that he did he did it because he didn't actually hurt anybody. And he got it because he has been routinely attacked and bullied and abused. So he needed it to protect himself. And he didn't even want to take the gun in the first place because he realized that he's on medication and he is emotionally unstable. He has problems regulating his emotions, so having a loaded gun is probably not a good idea. But even then, his co-worker convinced him to take it anyway. And who will take care of his mother if he gets arrested? So in his mind, his lie here seems very justifiable. Now, Arthur's relationship with people in his life. Let's explore that. First, his mother. Her name is Penny. At first, it may sometimes seem that she is loving and caring, but it quickly becomes clear that she is way too narcissistic and unempathetic, sometimes perhaps without even realizing it herself. For example, when she just tells him that he's not funny. That was incredibly painful to Arthur. And I remember at that moment, everyone in the movie theater was like, oh shit, this is really bad. According to the medical records and a flashback scene, she's clinically ill. She's narcissistic and schizophrenic. She's clinically depressed. She has a lot of issues. She's obsessed with Thomas Wayne. And she keeps sending him letters, even though he never responds, nor it is clear if he even receives and reads them. Her delusion is that Thomas Wayne cares about her and her son, and that Arthur is indeed his son. We see such obsessions in real life when fans get really obsessed with celebrities, they stalk them, and are convinced even that their child is from that celebrity, even though there's no evidence of that. So this is a real thing that happens in real life. So Arthur takes care of her, takes care of his mom. He doesn't want for her to worry, so he tells her that everything is fine, that she shouldn't worry about money and other problems, that he will take care of everything. Later in the movie, we learn that Unsurprisingly, Arthur was severely abused as a child. According to his mom's medical records, he was adopted, which was a huge shock to Arthur when he learned about it. And since he was adopted, it means that he already had severe trauma from being abandoned by his biological parents. And on top of that, Penny was severely neglectful, narcissistic, and abusive as a mother and we learned that she used to cuff him to a radiator and there were signs of severe physical abuse and neglect. She, for example, didn't protect him from her abusive partner. Arthur consciously doesn't remember anything from his childhood. Uh, he doesn't remember this going on. He doesn't remember his relationship with his mom as a child. In one of his delusions, Arthur tells Murray, the TV host, that he still lives with his mom and that he's been the man of the house as far as he can remember. So Penny raised him in a way so that he would take care of her both physically and emotionally. It is understandable then that Arthur doesn't share his struggles and worries and problems with her because his life has always been about making her happy. It also seems that as it is common in a narcissistic codependent type of a relationship that they have quite an enmeshed relationship with very poor boundaries and many unhealthy tendencies. All of that personal history and upbringing was the main cause of Arthur's descent into madness, into depression, into struggle, and eventually into violence. 
After reading the file about how horrible his mother was and feeling betrayed by her lies and secrets about being adopted and her relationship with Thomas Wayne, he eventually decides to suffocate her in her hospital bed. Now let's talk about his relationship with Murray Franklin, the TV show host. It is a parasocial relationship. Parasocial means that it is not real. In other words, there is no real relationship with Murray. Arthur is a big fan of Murray, but Murray doesn't even know that Arthur exists. He literally is a nobody to Murray. But to Arthur, Murray is an idealized father figure. It makes even more sense given that Arthur never had a real father figure in his real life. So in his delusion, Arthur imagines Murray defending him and accepting him and being proud of him. Murray is a validating father figure in that fantasy. He accepts Arthur for taking care of his mom and living with her, even as an adult, and he feels proud of Arthur. But in real life, Murray was mocking Arthur and using him for goofy content, saying that, hey, look at the silly weirdo, thinking he's a stand-up comedian, haha, <laughs> let's laugh at him. So this huge contrast between Arthur's fantasy, where he's embraced by his father figure, and accepted by society and reality is incredibly shocking to and painful to Arthur. Murray publicly mocks Arthur, mocks his attempt at stand-up comedy, which was the only thing left for him regarding his identity and, and uh, his aim at improving his life finally. And in doing all of that, He's publicly mocked, so the world can see that he's just a joke and people just laugh at him. So you can see how big Arthur's pain, disappointment, shock and anger are when he feels publicly betrayed, rejected, humiliated by this loving father figure that he had imagined and fantasized about, all while attempting to achieve his greatest dream and follow his last hope to improve his life. That's why he decides to murder Murray later. This pain, shame, betrayal, as Arthur experiences it, is much more significant than it would have been otherwise. Also, one could argue that to Arthur, in that scene where he eventually shoots Murray, Murray represents every person in society who mocked, bullied, and humiliated him. By killing him live on TV, Arthur effectively creates vicarious trauma for the audience, and that's his revenge on the whole society, all at once, all in one act. We, as human beings, we can experience trauma vicariously. We can develop PTSD even if we are merely observing somebody else in pain. And there have been many cases of people being traumatized by seeing or otherwise vicariously experiencing abuse and trauma. And we also know that trauma can be transferred to other generations. And it happens all the time with childhood trauma. People un unconsciously inflict their unresolved trauma onto their children, who then grow up and do the same to their own children, and so on until somebody is able to break the chain. So it's not perfectly clear when Arthur decided that he won't be killing himself, but will kill Murray instead. But it, it is very possible that it happened the very last minute when Arthur was telling a knock-knock joke and setting up a punchline where he kills himself after, just like he practiced at home. But then Murray made fun of him again, so he shot Murray instead. Now let's talk about his neighbor slash girlfriend, Sophie. It is very common with lonely people that if someone shows them just a tiny bit of attention, 
they clasp onto it and become obsessed with it because it means so much to them. They crave it so badly because they have been deprived of it for so long. This is what Arthur experiences with his neighbor, who was being friendly to him in an elevator. He really liked it, and he needed it, so he becomes obsessed with her and starts stalking her and having delusions about her. And at first, it is shown that eventually they are starting to date, but it seemed a little weird and unrealistic, at least to me. And here I actually called it immediately. I remember I leaned to the person I was with and said, this is not actually happening. This is too unrealistic. It's just all in his head. And indeed, it was later revealed that the dating part of this relationship was all imagined. He was having delusions that it is happening while in reality he was just being by himself. Imagining her laughing at his terrible jokes, telling him that the killer clown is a hero, being with him when he needed her, when he failed his first stand-up performance, when people made fun of him, when he was going on a walk, when his mother got into the hospital, she was there for him. She was by his side. She was affectionate. All of it was his way of coping with loneliness, humiliation, shame, and overwhelm that he wasn't aware of at the moment and only became aware of later. That's why he comes to her apartment later and then gets upset that she acts in a cold manner, all while from her perspective, she just came home, her child in is in the other room sleeping and her weird neighbor whom she doesn't even know that well is in her apartment acting in a creepy manner and it is unclear whether Joker killed Sophie and her daughter after realizing that. Now his relationship with his social worker with his therapist. Throughout the movie, Arthur visits his social worker for therapy. She always seems cold, disinterested, and inconsiderate. She doesn't listen to him to the degree where he openly confronts her later about it. After telling him that the funding for his therapy and medication has been cut, so he won't be able to see her again, or anybody else for that matter. She just tells him that nobody really cares about him, and nobody cares about her too. That's a really horrible thing to say to someone in such a situation, because the only person that Arthur gets to talk to becomes unavailable, and then tells him that nobody really cares about helping him, that must trigger a very strong sense of betrayal and abandonment. This whole therapeutic environment here is very unhelpful and untherapeutic, actually. So it is understandable why Arthur's psychological problems don't get any better. And after he had to stop taking seven medications that he was on called Turkey, it only got worse. Because of his upbringing, Arthur didn't develop a strong sense of self. Actually, he wasn't allowed to be his true self at all. He was raised to take care of others, especially his mother. Because of that, Arthur wants recognition, validation, and acceptance. We can see that in one of his major delusions where he's on TV and no matter how awkward he is, he's accepted by his father figure, Murray Franklin, and the crowd that represents society here also accepts him eventually and cheers for him. He didn't have that as a child because he was severely, horribly abused and then forced 
to play a happy child, a happy person, even though, according to him, all he ever felt was pain. His nickname that his mother gave him is Happy. His calling in life, again, according to his mom, is to bring happiness to the world and to make people smile and laugh. In other words, to sacrifice himself, to betray his emotions, to betray his real goals and uh, needs in order to make others happy, to live for others, to meet other people's needs and expectations. This is the ultimate self-erasure and self-sacrifice that Arthur learned and internalized. And many people are actually raised like that. To quote Arthur, the worst part of having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. Or to put it differently, the worst thing about having psycho-emotional problems is not being able to show how you really feel, to be accepted, to receive empathy and understanding. So Arthur was never allowed to express sadness, pain and misery, and despite his horrific life's circumstances, he was expected to succeed and be normal, whatever that means. And although it is explained that his tick, where he laughs uncontrollably, is more likely a neurologic disorder, I think it's called pseudo-bulbar effect, which could have developed because of all the abuse he experienced growing up, it is also very plausible that not being allowed to be anything but happy made him develop this tick as a coping mechanism, where he feels strong, unacceptable emotions and then has to pretend to be happy and laugh, especially being around his mom as a child. Later in the movie, when his inner pain becomes too unbearable, he starts fantasizing about suicide, about going to the Murray Franklin show and killing himself. He wants for everyone to see his pain, to recognize it, to be affected by it, to see his tragic life, and to finally feel sympathy for him, instead of all the cruelness that they've been showing him all his life. This is actually how most people with severe mental problems feel and behave. Most don't hurt others. Most hurt themselves. Most are cruel to themselves. They direct their pain inwards. And we can see that in Arthur too. Deep down, he's a simple man. He just wants for his pain to go away. And he wants for people to stop treating him with cruelty and inconsideration. He feels he doesn't deserve it. And he doesn't. That's why it is so easy for the viewer to empathize with him and to feel sympathy for him. Up to that point, he's an underdog. He's a victim of abuse and circumstances. Everyone can relate to that to one degree or another. Everyone has experienced some injustice in their life. However, after one misfortune and another one and another and being misunderstood for his good intentions and being bullied and being fired, and being threatened, and being manipulated, and being laughed at, and the closest person in his life, his mom, getting to a hospital, and being attacked again, and already having this huge baggage of trauma from his upbringing before that, he eventually takes a different route. Throughout the movie, we see him getting increasingly more frustrated and frantic, we see him releasing his anger, desperation, and frustration first by banging his head against objects, a form of self-punishment, and later hitting things, and kicking bags of garbage outside, and so on. So the anger gradually moves outwards. But eventually he can't handle it anymore. His ability to regulate his emotions can't keep up with all the overwhelming events both external and internal, and so he feels increasingly more overwhelmed and out of control. His first murder wasn't planned. Actually, his first violent act was in self-defense. It's when on the train, three obnoxious, entitled, drunk guys start harassing a woman and then him. He doesn't even want to be involved in it. 
but he can't stop laughing. So the guys start attacking him. And then eventually he shoots two of them. That's why, again, up to this point, it is possible to sympathize with Arthur. That's why later the people of Gotham see him as a hero, although not knowing the full story and context for what actually happened. But what comes after that is not self-defense. For a little while he feels shocked that he just murdered two people, but he quickly overcomes it and wants to kill more. Killing the first two guys made him feel better. The bullying and laughter and harassment and physical abuse stopped. It made him feel control over his environment, over his life. It gave him hope that things can get just a little bit better, that the pain can be just a little bit less severe. So he kills the third guy. Over time, with every murder, he feels more empowered and self-confident. It shows in his delusions too, where he goes to his neighbor's apartment to kiss her and seemingly have sex with her later. He's also more outspoken at work, and he just overall feels much better. He also notices that people are talking about him. He feels more significant. He feels visible. Violence makes him feel empowered, but also seen. And he wants to be seen and accepted. This is a mentality of a neglected child who desperately acts out in order for their parents and other authority figures to notice them, because being ignored is more painful than negative attention. Let's talk about revenge. Arthur, who is now transforming into Joker, wants revenge. He wants to hurt those who hurt him, in actuality or as he sees it. And granted, almost all the people in the movie were cruel to him for no good reason, it seems. And you know how sometimes highly narcissistic or otherwise abusive or toxic people cross your boundaries and you say no, or you don't give them what they demand, and then they perceive it as an attack on them. And whatever comes after, they see as justified because you, quote-unquote, hurt them, even though objectively you just set healthy boundaries and they didn't like it. Well, this is not it here in the movie. The people in Arthur's life were all cruel, except for the short guy whom he decides not to kill for this very reason, even though he becomes a witness to Arthur's killing of the co-worker who gave him the gun. So his co-workers made fun of him. The guy who gave him the gun came to his apartment just to get more information about, about the situation with the gun, not because he really cared about Arthur. His boss didn't believe him, betrayed him and threatened to fine him basically for being attacked. Thomas Wayne didn't even want to talk to him, he rudely dismissed him, and even physically attacked him, although it is unclear what actually happened between him and Arthur's mom. His mom, she was again abusive to him, and chose not to protect him from abuse, and lied to him, and used him, and Murray, his idol, publicly humiliated him, so all the people were pretty mean to him. So Arthur wants to murder them. In his mind, it's justified. And after you have this mentality, it's easy to go more extreme and to justify anything. So I would guess that even later, when he possibly murdered his romantic interest and his new social worker at the end of the movie, he had justifications for it in his mind. She betrayed me, or she doesn't care about me. That's good enough for him. After he starts killing, he also finally feels admiration and acceptance of those who support him killing those three rich guys on the train. And although for others it is a political statement, 
Arthur doesn't care about politics or society. He has his own problems. So for Arthur, violence and all his antisocial behavior is all personal and driven by his personal struggles and grievances without much thought or consideration for others. Violence, murder, and chaos become his new motivation in life. It gives him purpose to live. It gives him a false feeling of freedom and lightness and happiness. He feels free after murdering his mother. He doesn't have to pretend to be happy anymore. Happy is gone. He becomes Joker, the nickname that his parasocial father figure gave him to mock him. But he embraces it. He becomes more confident and outspoken. He expresses himself more freely, for example, via energetic dancing. Even his uncontrollable laughter is less prevalent, as it doesn't happen at all in his real conversation with Murray before Arthur kills him. He finds an identity that he always lacked. I would argue that this is not who he really is, that's not his true self, as becoming Joker was a response to decades of abuse, pain, struggle, and suffering, and it leads only to many horrific outcomes for others and for himself. But it's the identity, the persona that he chooses. It's the only thing in his experience that actually made him feel better. One of the questions someone asked me is, would it be possible for Arthur, or someone like Arthur, in real life, to actually get better? And before that, we need to talk about society and its role in people's lives. Unfortunately, Arthur lives in a very crappy place, where he's really struggling. The whole lower class, by definition, is really struggling. It gradually makes Arthur's problems worse. His therapist sucks, he's on a huge cocktail of drugs, and later he doesn't even have access to any of that anymore. Good therapy would help Arthur cope better, but without changing his life, his living conditions, it probably would be impossible to become truly healthy and happy. He still would need to make money and deal with violence and misery around him. Arthur seems like a guy who generally wanted to get better. But I don't know if there's a decent therapist in Gotham that Arthur could see or could afford. In our society, in reality, I wish there were more proper help and resources available for those who want and can get better. And maybe learning to deal with his emotions better in therapy would have helped Arthur find a way how to move out of Gotham and move to a better place and start a new life where undoubtedly there would be struggles and problems, but maybe it wouldn't be as horrible as Gotham, which would make his problems just a little bit better. So the issue is complex and complicated. All of us have some unresolved trauma from our childhood. Moreover, we live in a highly unhealthy society and we act out our unresolved traumas daily. And on top of that, we experience many traumas and micro-traumas in daily lives, which makes healing the initial traumas even more difficult. And then there's social inequity, where some people have it better or worse than others and some don't even have enough to survive. And when you don't have enough resources for your basic needs, and you have to work all the time just not to die, and you have no time or energy to explore other options, or you have no other options because you literally can't quit without dying on the street, can you really work on your childhood trauma and emotional regulation and rediscovering your true self? You can't. And that's tragic. Now, another problem is that people who suffer from delusions and severe irrationality and are also isolated and have nobody to challenge their delusions 
is that their delusions get worse. We see that in Arthur's mom and to a lesser degree in Arthur himself. Penny, his mom, has no job. She's stuck at home. She can't take care of herself. So her mental problems over time are only getting worse as she has no social perspectives and not much to do. And Arthur is not mentally well enough himself to help her with that. The problem with isolation and delusion is that people like that need somebody to verify reality. They already rely on their emotions to inform them about the world and to make decisions because their perception and processing abilities are often skewed. And they also use delusion to cope with painful emotions. And so over time, the cycle gets worse and worse. In contrast, if you are with someone who is more rational, they can confirm or deny what is happening. They can help you understand what's real and what's not real and how to deal with that. But if you are alone, there is no one to correct or confirm whatever you're experiencing, which over time makes people's problems worse because they come up with all the other delusions on top of that to explain why they think and feel the way they feel. Another problem that we don't see in the movie so much, but it's very common in today's society, is delusional and otherwise rational people finding other delusional, irrational, or even predatory people online who then only validate their delusions and irrational thoughts so you feel encouraged and justified in staying delusional while thinking that you're okay and not as bad instead of actually getting better because your delusions seem even more real now and reality seems more unreal. It's really horrifying. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And while Arthur has stuff to do and he interacts with the world and others somewhat, it's still far from being enough. He still exists in a highly unhealthy environment and has to deal with his unwell mother, who is one of the main people that made him the way that he is in the first place. And you can't get much better in an unhealthy environment, especially in an environment where your problem started. You need to get out of that and get into a healthier environment. While someone like Heath Ledger's Joker seems to be too far gone, I think it would have been possible to help Arthur before he became Joker and maybe even after he started killing. In real life, someone like Arthur would need a lot of support. He would need a really good therapist who would actually listen to him and deeply cared about him and would help him understand the origins of his pain and be on his side. Arthur would need to feel safe to talk about his relationship with his mom, about his childhood, about his current problems, about all the pressures and expectations that drove him to develop all those unhealthy tendencies and overwhelming emotions. He would need to have a healthier environment and lifestyle where he wouldn't feel so stressed, where he wouldn't be abused, where he could express himself and feel valued, where he would feel that people are not dangerous, that people care about him, that life can get better. In that scenario, over time, he would learn to understand his emotions and thoughts better. He would learn that there are healthier coping mechanisms. He would learn how to be more socially aware and respect other people's boundaries and to be respected by others without trying to please or scare them. He would learn that there are people in the world who care. He would learn how to build and maintain healthier relationships with others, starting with his relationship with himself. Over time, Arthur's delusions and unhealthy behaviors would diminish and maybe even evaporate completely. There are many examples of people who overcame schizophrenia and psychosis without drugs even. 
mainly by being able to stay with caring and loving people, being able to explore their problematic emotions and thoughts, and having stuff to do, having meaning. For more, you can search for Daniel Mackler's documentaries on it. One is called Healing Homes, the other one is Take Those Broken Wings, and Open Dialogue. They are subtitled in many languages, and I myself have translated three of them. So it's definitely possible to get better even from such severe issues that Arthur suffers from. I will talk about mental illness and mental health more in other videos. So these are my thoughts about the movie, about the Joker character, and mental health as it relates to our society. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below or in a private message if you so desire. Like the video and share it with others if you found it interesting. Consider supporting us on Patreon uh, or don't. It's up to you. Stay safe and see you in the future. Bye.